take a trip with us to New Park. Just promise not to drink the goo. If you get sucked into the matrix, we will send a phone for you. Do you believe in fate? But every movie has a plot hole. And every hole gets filled somehow. With whiskey, wine, or blue milk. Just don't cut me off right now. With a Club of two. We're the plotaholics, ripping plots apart for you. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Hey everybody, hey. welcome to another episode of the Plotaholics Podcast. I'm Shane Wilson, now with more energy. <laughs> Maybe. And I'm Maybe. joined as always by my podna in crime, Brian Pod. Tan. I see what you did there. Hey, oh, how's it going there, Shane? I got Miss Odette in my lap now. Yeah, she's all up in well, your she's... grill mix. Yeah, this you know this is what she does. I mean, we were um, working on some of our bonus con. I was working on some of our bonus content for the week, and she started to do the same thing. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's what? hard to be mad at her affection, right? It really is, except when you're using the toilet. Then well, it's like, dude, no boundaries. Can you learn some boundaries, please? That is a fair point. Dogs yeah, do not gooched- understand boundaries. No, she gooched me earlier this week, dude. Oof. Ooh, she really, you, she got really the old, you got the old pooch gooch. Yeah, I got, the old, <laughs> I got the old snout to the pooper, man. It was it was it was uncomfortable for sure. Man, oh, man. Uh, Brian, mm-hmm. this week we uh, are here to talk about the 1995, is it? Uh, 1995, yes. Yeah, John Singleton film, Higher Learning. Yeah, continuing the uh, the tradition. Obviously, we didn't do it last year because of the you know the the our anniversary right but um yeah we around this time when we first started the podcast uh, three years ago now um we decided because we lost john singleton and we decided we wanted to start you know showing some love to this amazing filmmaker and we're back to it this week with probably i think this is a very, very strong film, Higher Learning. I, you know, this is, this is a, this is a heartbreaking film in so many ways, but it's way more, I guess, grown up than Boys in the Hood, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, which of these, I haven't really looked at the filmography to the point that I would know the answer to my own question. Uh, which okay. came first? Boys in the Hood is his first. That's that's the first. That Boys in the Hood is the OG. That's the How first. How old was he when he made that film? Uh, let's see. Singleton was born in 1968, so I would say he's he was in his late 20s, early 30s. He was in his early 30s when it came out. 30. No. See, he would have been 20 and 88. So 23. So yeah, about 23 years old when when it came out. When Boys in the Hood came out. Yeah, 23 when Boys in the Hood came out. That is bananas, right? Uh, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. And this is his third film. This is his third feature. Boys in the Hood came first, then Poetic Justice, which we've both done. We've done both. And now Higher Learning. Yeah, that's uh, what a... What a lineup, you know, and I would I would argue that Poetic Justice is the weakest of the three. Um, but... Yeah, I agree. I, I would definitely agree with that. Now, here's some of the other films that he's done. Um, Rosewood, 1997. Shaft, 2000. Baby Boy, 2001. Too, he directed Too Fast. Too, now, he didn't write or produce Rosewood. 
Um, too Fast, Too Furious, he directed, didn't write or produce. Um, 2005, Four Brothers, directed, didn't write or produce. And then his final film was 2011's Abduction. Again, he was the director. He didn't write, write or produce it. Higher Learning and Poetic Justice, he directed, wrote, and produced. Yeah, so it looks like we're just kind of going down the list. Uh, and we're, we're kind of like covering that. them in chronological order so far. It kind of seems like it. I don't know. Next year, you want to shake it up a little? <laughs> no, man. I'm 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 down with this. It it means that eventually we'll get to do too fast, too furious. <laughs> That's what I was actually going to suggest. If you wanted to shake it up a little, do you want to do too fast, too furious next year? Because we no, haven't done any of the fast and furious films yet. I know, uh, but I guess- yeah, no. I mean, we. <laughs> I think that we could probably save that. You know, for. Uh, what is it? One, two, three, four years down the road. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, no, I mean, like we'll 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 talk about it. But I uh, did not even realize that he that that was on his filmography. Yep. Yes, it is. And we also have a tic, a plotaholics tic tac toe as well. Can you guess hmm. with who? Hmm. Hmm. Let's think about it for a second. Only Martin. looking at the only looking at the cast list here. I want to think it's Regina King. Is it? That's a, that's a negative. That's a negative. Well, actually, actually, you know what? No, you're right. You're right. We have two. She's one. I thought we had had her in a yeah, number of we things. Got her, we got her with Friday. We got her with this. And then what was the other one? Friday, this. Uh, and... I can look since, since uh, uh, I feel like Lawrence Fishburne is the other one. Yes, he is. Lawrence Fishburne is the other one. I'm trying to uh, think. What was Regina King? I believe that Regina King, uh, Boys in the Hood. Poetic Justice. Poetic Justice and Boys in Poetic the Hood. Poetic Justice. And Friday. Friday. So we so got we her almost, four times. We almost have a Regina King bingo. A Regina Kingo. Yeah, almost. Wait, did we do? We haven't done Jerry Maguire, have we? No, I, I was just Sorry. looking to see if, they, if we had done any of these others. Uh, and we have not. So, no, yeah. We so we not. are... We're one What's away happening? from a Regina Kingo. All right, so we're close. But Jen, and we've also done her first her first four films. Her first four live at her first four full length films. Boys well, in the she's, Hood. She's great in this as well. She really is. And um I definitely want to talk about the one scene with her where she really gets the chance to shine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. which was a good scene. But I'll tell you, with this film, one thing I noticed, because this is my first time watching this film for a little while. Yeah. And and it's as hard hitting as it was the first time I watched it. But it also hits a little bit harder for the simple fact that almost 30 years later, nothing has really changed. Nothing's really changed. And I'm going to, I don't know, do you, you know what, why don't I, why don't you slice us up a little of that tenopsis? Yeah, I was going to say, why don't I do a tenopsis before I uh, talk about what I mean? There you go. The film Higher Learning takes place at the fictional Christopher Columbus University, where three polarizing characters, Malik Williams, played by Omar Epps, Kristen Connor, played by Christy Swanson, and Remy, played by Michael Rappaport, are all incoming class freshmen. All three of them go through changes in a, in the sort of in the social dynamic of things. And in their changes, tragedy occurs. And they all learn something <laughs> in college. <laughs> I, mean, I was trying to go somewhere very, very insightful, but I mean, at the end of the day, they did all learn something in college, yeah. not, not what they planned on learning. They learned, yeah, they is. learned a lesson that they had no, they had no idea. They learned a lot more than they bargained for. There you go. They learned more than they bargained for. There you go. Uh, now, now I feel like, I feel like I redeemed myself there. Yeah. This movie, there is so much to, to, to do, to do here. Uh, and I don't even really know where to start. I guess we can start by looking at the three, uh, protagonists or the three leads. Uh, yeah. Oh, we, we, there, there's a third, there's actually another, um, 
tic-tac-toe in almost I swear, a window. you and Joe Compton, get your fucking nuts off on this thing. Because it's fun, so dude. So hard. I mean, but, like, does it matter? I mean, they're... There are only yes. so many people in movies, dude. Like, if you talk about movies for four There's years, you're going to have some double dips. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but we've got, like, you know, we're tripling and quadrupling. Andrew Bernarski. Um, he was in Necessary Roughness, Batman Returns. He was in this and in Street Fighter. So well, then, that, he that, doesn't, that, then he doesn't count because he's already had his tic-tac-toe. Yeah, that's and true. And you missed your opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> All right, so I forgot it last week because you know what? He's not he's not that interesting. Well, he's an interesting actor, but he's nowhere near as cool as like Regina King or um, Lawrence Fishburne. So there. Right. But he's still uh, cool. So uh-huh. as you were uh, as you were saying, you have uh, Malik Williams, Kristen Malik, Malik Connor, Malik, Malik, Kristen Connor. Yep. and Remy. No last yep. name given. Yeah. Well, the reason the reason why I put an emphasis on the pronounce pronunciation yeah. of his name is Remy at one point is purposefully mis- mispronouncing his name, right? Because of anger. Yeah, I, 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 I guess we should start with Remy. Let's start with Remy. Yeah. This this is very very. This is honestly. We haven't done a lot of Michael Rappaport films. There aren't a lot of Michael Rappaport films. There, there aren't a ton. I'm looking at his filmography now. Well, he's done more movies than I think either one of us has realized. But I think this is probably his best film. This is the best that he's done. Because he, he was also in Poetic Justice. But my, here's the thing with Michael Rappaport. I always saw Michael Rappaport back in the day as the white guy who is like he, he's the white guy trying to be black in films sort of like a precursor and i don't even want to call him a precursor of eminem but this was the white guy that's in films that is talking like he's black he's got that the, the quote-unquote urban accent i think just that's like, just because he grew up in the city right like isn't he yeah he's from like yeah, he, he's, he's from new, new york. york city right but the thing is i mean I've, I've met new yorkers i've met a few new yorkers in my time and they don't talk like michael rapaport does but once again this was the the stereotype of him i think back in the day so i think this was his first time playing a character that didn't do that and mm-hmm. This is probably among his strongest performances because Michael Rappaport is a likable guy as an actor. And, you know, I've I've seen he had a he had a failed TV show that was on Fox, which really disappointed me because I really enjoyed the show. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really thought it was fun. And a lot of things that I've seen Michael Rappaport in, I appreciate because he's very witty. He's very funny. Um. And he, he's just a fun, he's a fun character actor, right? Yeah. I, I've never disliked Michael Rappaport, but this is a film where not only do you just hate him as a character, but he's also very, very sympathetic. And it's crazy how it takes real acting chops to take a villainous character and make them likable and make them almost, they make them hateable but also you can sympathize with them at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cause it's hard yeah. to sympathize with the Remy character, but yeah, it, it is. And, and, and I don't, I mean, I think that, that there's an attempt uh, to make him a little sympathetic because he's an outsider. He's clearly out of his element. He, he's really, really, awkward he's very social he's awkward. awkward yeah and and he's the kind of guy that that gets indoctrinated Sorry. into groups like this yeah. uh and so like it all like it all checks out but i i i don't think that he's likable and i and i don't think well, that well like, likable is the wrong term i meant to say he's more of a sympathetic villain he's a sympathetic right. villain because I think, honestly, let's be real here. When you look at our leads and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The one thing that I like about this is that everyone is insanely flawed. All the characters are insanely flawed. Um, Remy, obviously, 
he's the socially awkward guy who didn't start out as a bad person. He just doesn't know how to talk to people. He always says the wrong things at the wrong times. And he means well, but he's he he screws up and but he's also bullied, mistreated, and the only people that ever seemed to want to be friends with him turned out to be these neo-Nazis, right? Right. And then you look at Malik, the character Malik played masterfully by Omar Epps, who really carries this film in his oh, own I way. I think like, before we before we move to Malik. I still think okay. that right. that well, there is ahead. there's strong evidence to suggest that Remy had all of the makings of a neo Nazi. This dude wasn't brainwashed. They found him, and they just they, they found they just him and they, they boosted they all of out. the all of his natural inclinations. This is the guy that called the police on a party, right? Yeah, but I can understand why. I understand why he did. And this is where I'm going. This is where I'm getting to is that no. And the one thing that I like about this film is that nobody, nobody, nobody in this film is without their own bit of blame in some of their stories because they all do messed up things. They all oh, yeah. do things that are screwed up. They're all and flawed. That's what but like. this guy yeah, is... Everyone is flawed, but he's, he, he is, I mean, I can understand why he called the police called campus security because he did try to say come on man i got for get sure class. i understand oh, it too but like the other party that was as loud was not that far from his dorm yeah but it was in his room because they were in the suite he, his room was off of that suite i mean i so, get it but like the like you can I mean, still hear the other party is like you know and the when you talk about like the socially awkward uh, nature of him and everything like yeah, like socially awkward is is one way to put it, but the way that he talks uh, about how uh, like uh, and he does he doesn't know what happened in the in that bedroom, right? But when he's at the right. frat party and she comes yeah. down, she's and, visibly yeah. upset, but he's still yeah. like, "You gave it to her good, huh?" Like this yeah. dude is all is had was always a piece of shit. Like, yeah, I think he was probably less. I don't even, you know what? I mean, I don't think he was going to shoot anybody at the beginning of the movie, right, but he was right. still, he still had hate he's and an he idiot. still had perversion in his heart. He's an idiot is what it is. He, he's an idiot. He's an yeah. absolute moron. Why did he go? But, he wanted to be an engineer. Yeah. He was going to school to be an engineer. And I mean, and you know what? And you're absolutely right. He, he's, he's not a good guy, but you can also see that he's behaving the way he is because he's searching for acceptance. Right. Uh, and, well, and to your point, none of them are, are good, quote unquote, good people. Uh, no, everyone, it's, is it's an, just, everyone has asshole tendencies. In this film. Well, and it, and it just is, it just so happens that the other two leads tend to, their arc tends to take them towards some sort of enlightenment. Whereas yeah. his enlightenment takes him into a very dark place. Right. Because like I said, with Remy, I mean, you're absolutely right. He, um, he, he calls campus security, you know, I mean, honestly, I, I seriously think that if he would have gone to the fudge character, ice cubes character and said, Hey man, look, I'm not trying to be a dick, but I really, I got to get up early in the morning. You know, can, you know, can we, can we wrap the party up a little bit? Now, granted, we we only know what we saw in the film, but he probably, you know, they, they probably could have handled that a little bit better, blah, blah, blah. Although Fudge seems like he's just kind of an asshole and he's going to yeah. be an asshole no well, matter what. Well, because somebody does ask Fudge, is it, is, but it's not him, right? It's uh, it's not Remy that asks when the party's going to No, it's the, other, it's the other roommate. He right. goes, hey, man, we're going to clear this out soon. It's over when it's over. Right. Dude. So Fudge is an asshole. Yeah. Fudge. Fudge is a dick. He really uh, well, is. I mean, so to to most of their credits, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To Fudge's credit, to Malik's credit, to like to everybody's credit except for Remy, uh, we were all assholes when we were eighteen to twenty three. Yeah, well, yeah, because you figure Fudge has been. They they even say in the film that Fudge has been at that school for six years. Yeah. So I would love to know what how much money his family has for him to be in college for six freaking years. Right. But um, uh, yeah, but yeah we, well, we were all awful people, but very, very few of us end up shooting people and committing like hate crimes. 
Very true. No, you're 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 not wrong. You're, you're absolutely not wrong. I just I I really think that with the Remy character, I want to and you know maybe it's just me trying to find the best in people, and I haven't become as jaded as I think that I am. I really think that Remy starts out as this wide-eyed from Boise, Idaho, um, being around, you know, people that don't look like him for the first time. He only knows what his survivalist dad has told him. But he's trying to go in there with this open mind. And people are just, you know, you know, he's not fitting in. And he's starting to default on the bullcrap that maybe he got from his family. Well, and, no, I, I do and think so that. And it just makes it worse and worse and worse. And then that indoctrination from the neo-Nazis, it just seals it. Well, I think that, I think that you're right, that he just wanted to fit in, et cetera, et cetera. And whichever group showed him kindness first was going to be the group that he that he belonged to uh it just so happened that that it was these guys but also like i I just keep going back to the fact that he had hate in his heart because as soon as a guy came up to him and asked him to go out for a drink he assumed that that dude was gay and started like being hateful to him right and i think that's one part yeah already has the 19th the, you know the mid 90s the homophobia is real anytime anyone comes up to you and blah 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 yeah obviously it's some i think that's definitely there but i also think that that's also a de- he was also in that high defense mechanism because everyone has just been mean to him like from the day he got there they're they're picking on him no one like i come on man let's just be friends and no one wants to be friends with me and now here's this guy and you probably only want to be friends with me because you want to mess with me and you know what i mean and then he just defaults to homophobia i'm not saying it's right i'm in no way saying it's right it's despicable as all hell i'm just looking for the why no that's you're why. and you're right about the why but but i but like to when i said that uh he would like whichever group showed him kindness, he would he would happily belong to that group. I don't actually know that that's true, because I think that if the group that had tried to show him kindness was some sort of LGBT outreach group on campus, he would have rejected oh, he, them. Oh, he absolutely would have, because once again, cis male. And so, so he can so he plays the victim like a lot of, you know, quote unquote white. strong yeah. white people do, right? Like. He plays the victim and he, and what, what it really amounts to is that he's a brittle spirit, right? He's uh, very soft. He's very soft. He's very brittle. And it's shown multiple as times. As are the rest of the men in that group. Right. Because how many times did he, he had so many opportunities. The only time he really shows toughness is when he's around his fellow neo-Nazis and when he has a gun. And That's it's super it. easy to be tough when you're the only one with a gun and when you're around other people that only agree with you. Right. Because, I mean, you even look at points where, a matter of fact, the only, and then the only other time he was tough was when he saw him with a, with, he was out in public with his girl, with the, the guys with his girlfriend, and he knew he could run away. Yeah. Those are literally the only times he was tough. Yeah, he's garbage. Yeah. He, he is, he's a garbage human being. He absolutely well, is. Well, and you can absolutely blame his upbringing and his isolation in Idaho for all of that. And that, and you'd absolutely be within reason to do so. But that just is, is indicative of, of a larger problem, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, garbage is garbage. You're going to be garbage no matter what. Right. You know, and unless, so, unless you decide to not be trash. Right. And this was his opportunity, right? He got out of Idaho. He's around a bunch of interesting people. But I I go to the first shot in the film, which I think is really interesting because the opening shot is an orientation day uh, at Columbus University. And not only is it, I don't know, very reminiscent of Nazis, uh, the way that they're all sort of like, you know, punching the air, like for the marching band and everything. But you also see this image of Remy like that 
where he's not doing that, right? Like he is walking counter to everyone. He's like cutting across the crowd. Uh, and it shows like, fi- like visually that this guy is sort of counter to the, to the mainstream. Right. He really is. And um, I think it's very, very interesting that the film start, he's the first of our leads that we really see mm-hmm. because I mean, in a lot of ways, this is kind of Remy's story. Oh, yeah. In so, this, In so many ways, this is Remy's story because all the events of this film shape who Remy becomes and what Remy does. This film, all these events, if you really look at most of it, it all shapes it. The party, both parties, the party with um, Ice Cube's Fudge, the party with Christy Swanson's um, Kristen, um, all of it shapes who Remy becomes and what Remy does. Right, wrong, and different. It yeah. shapes it all. And it's, it does. And it's but they all you know, they all shape each other too, though, right? Like that. They, they shape each other because now, because when you look at when um, Kristen and Malik first meet each other. Kristen does the typical Karen thing where they're and they're alone together in mm-hmm. a um, they're alone together in an elevator and she clutches her purse and he just gives her that right. typical. And that's the only time they're ever on screen together again until the end. Right. Which is and I thought he- a really nice parallel, right? Or or a nice echo because whenever they're on screen together, finally again at the end, they have the same sort of moment. They, I don't even know that they remember each other from the beginning because it's just an elevator really exchange, they right? Really yeah. But, but at the end, because of what they've all gone through, like she embraces him, he embraces her, right? Like it's like, it is this sort of growth through trauma sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And you see a lot of growth in both Malik and Kristen, you know, we already yeah. said, you know, they, they go to the, their enlightenment takes them to with Malik. It's more of, uh, he's, he's understanding what everyone around him has been talking about when it comes to his academics. He has a more, alert. yeah, he has a more intellectual awakening, right? Right. Kristen has a more social awakening mm-hmm. and a sexual awakening as well. Yeah. Brought on by trauma. And Remy is the one that goes down that dark path. Yeah. And um, I'm looking at the film poster right now, and I really find it very telling that Omar Epps' Malik is not among the four faces that we see. We see Lawrence Fishburne, we see Michael Rappaport, we see Ice Cube, and we see Kristen Swanson. And I think the reason why we see that is because honestly, Malik is like a more clueless version of the Ice Cube character Fudge. He's very clueless. He's very, very well. I mean, I mean, not, not that one. I mean, there, there's an alternate um, film cover that I'm looking at. Um, yeah, not that one. Not that one. It's it's got the uh, that one. Yeah. Because he's a more clueless version of Fudge, right? Because Fudge is very intellectual. As but and then you get the uh, Doctor Phipps character who is intellectual in a different light than Fudge is. Omar and Epps, he, uh, prior to this, had been in what? He was in Juice. Okay. I was wondering if it was like a billing thing because I, it was, it, well, well, by then he, he had been in juice daybreak, the program and major league two mm-hmm. by this point. So he had a couple of films under his belt, but I think that this film is what really cemented him as a lead because you figure juice, he was the lead. And then the program he was like in this film, he was another member of an ensemble cast. Yeah. Um, Christy Swanson had been in some stuff before this as well. And you want to talk about someone who, I mean, because Christy Swanson was in Pretty in Pink, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, um, Hot Shots. 
She was in a couple of things, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the program. So this is actually the second time that she was she shared she was in a film with Omar Epps, but with very very minimal minimal um, screen time together. Yeah, well, let's, I, I think we should go and talk. Well, I think we should talk about one of them, one of their arcs next. Who would you like to go to next? You know, let, let's go to, um, let, let's save Malik for last, because Malik is, in a lot of ways, he, he's the top build character, but it's not really his story. I think this yeah. is more, like I said, this is more Remy's story. But Kristen, I think that she has a lot of growth as well, because she's this Orange County girl sheltered orange county girl starts out the film really as a sheltered as maybe even calling her a karen isn't super fair i think that the brigitte wilson character nicole is way more of a karen than christy swanson's Kristen mm -hmm. is but she yeah, i don't is, think that i don't think she, that i would call christy a... she's more she's more naive I guess she's she, more. Yeah, of a she's not even. She's also not the one out here calling the police and. Oh, and she's like, not. And she's not using casual. Her her casual racism isn't so much hatred. It's more just fear of the unknown. It's also mostly harmless. Like it it like is it is a microaggression, right? But it's not putting anyone in danger. It's not as aggressive as the why do they always have to make trouble? Like right like other character no you're right yeah, you're right hers is just like on is just unsure she is what I'm, she I'm she thinking. is what remy could have been right like she comes from another place she's unfamiliar with these with with different kinds of people in different cultures uh mm -hmm. and but she embraces the college experience and learns more about different cultures and learns more about different kinds of people and she shows that uh what you would what you hope higher learning right is able to achieve correct she really becomes very very um i think she's probably the most open-minded of our three leads and i think that that's she's a direct result of of her trauma right right well i think that she's kind of open-minded and childish even at the beginning because you see the scene where she as soon as she's faced with adversity with her um with her um financial situation she's bawling mm -hmm. like she's absolutely bawling like oh no the whole world's falling apart it's like right dude, go to the financial aid office and work out some arrangements why are you crying you know what i mean mm -hmm. and even when um dr phipps is talking to her and she's just completely missing the point because she's so childish and he's even like oh lord jesus learn how to critically think right who's uh who's the guy uh that um rapes her jr ferguson who plays the role of billy, billy. i was billy. Jay, to be clear jr ferguson did not rape anyone billy raped <laughs> Kristen. billy raped Kristen. Kristen. jr yeah. ferguson who is also right now plays um Ben on the Connors mm -hmm. and was also in campfire tales. I remember him in that he's more of a TV guy. Yeah. I was, um, I was, I was thinking that his name was Danny for some reason, but Billy, this scene yeah. is so transformative it's, and it is rough. It's really hard to watch. And this is once again, more of that toxic masculinity of the nineties of a guy that's just trying to say he he's, He's sort of walking with that Brock Turner type of entitlement this, when it comes this, to sexual contact. This film is prophetic uh, in a lot of ways, I think. And it, it is it is ahead of its time. It sees a lot of things coming uh, ways, on a, on a cultural time. level before they got here. One being this scene, which is uh, a... It is not a cut and dry rape, right? Like he doesn't spike her drink and like have her pass out and then have his way with her. This is what would t technically be considered revoked consent, right? Uh, right. And there is that a moment, there right. is a moment, he's not stopping to follow her wishes. Now, where he's wrong, obviously, once a woman says no, it's That's over it. and done. Yeah. 
And this is a this is a debate that we're that I mean, this is not a debate that we, you and I are having. This is a debate no. that the country is having uh, mostly. Well, regardless, there's a there are some people that would argue that once you say yes, everything else doesn't matter. But revoked consent is a real thing. And a yeah. woman can decide, uh, as can a man at any point at any point during a sexual encounter that this is the end of it. Right. Like this, this, this encounter right. is over. Right. And his argument is going to be, well, I was in the moment. All right. We understand that you were in the moment. But when a woman says no, she says no. But this is that that entitlement yeah. that there are men today that still that still they still have this idea of entitlement on a woman's body. Yeah. Well, and, and I think uh, that even even beyond revoked consent, there's also conditional consent given in this scene. Right. I'm complete. She, she's saying I am completely willing to have sex with you, but you need to wear a condom. Right. And, and he's like, in a minute now, she's like, well, then no. Right. And that and, and all this, he would have had to like, do was put on a condom. Just, yeah. Take the five seconds it would take to get up get the condom and put it on or the five minutes it would take to leave the room and ask one of your frat brothers. Hey, right. there are condoms in that house. There are condoms in that house. And this Billy person is the type of guy that if he had a younger sister or a cousin and he found out that she was in the same situation prior to this situation, I'm going to kick that guy's ass. Okay. So then what stopped you? Right. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And you know, like that's, that is such a common issue, right? The whole, well, you know, I have a mom and I have a daughter and I have like, none of that should matter, bro. Like j these are people. <laughs> right. Like, do you and have to have a mom to know that it's yeah. bad to hurt a woman? Right. Yeah. Why do you have to, why do you have to search for a commonality to not be an asshole? Right. Like, like seriously, why? Yeah. And the Billy, yeah. but Billy, the Billy character is yet another of these fragile as white guys that are trying to put themselves in a position of power and authority. Yeah. Because he gets Except, real apologetic oh, real fast, you know? Oh man. As soon as someone that he doesn't have weight over or some sort of social power over shows up, hey, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry, beautiful, beautiful black. Oh, notice though, he's not sorry for what he did to Kristen. Uh, right, well, sorry. so he's sorry for being called out for being a racist. Right. Also, I think it should be noted that it, I think it's a, an important detail that Kristen is so hesitant to admit that she's a victim of sexual assault because the reason that he's not forced to apologize for what he did to her is because no one knows exactly what he did to her. Right. All they know is that she was crying. He, she, yeah. She was crying. That's it. Now you would think that the Monet character, I would think that she would understand what happened but she doesn't she's more concerned with the fact that this this guy called her a black bitch well Basically, also, for, context, for context for those that haven't seen the movie after K Kristen gets away from billy after she said no and he's gonna keep going she gets away runs out of the house and goes back to her dorm and monet her roommate sees her crying miller time and Billy calls like he's going to like, let's just talk about this, Kristen. And Monet is covering for her roommate. She doesn't want to talk to you right now. And he gets mad and calls her a black bitch because he feels like there's no, there's going to be no consequences. Monet goes and tells Ice Cube's character, Fudge, Fudge and all of his buddies show up. And her whole thing is, you called me a black bitch. Now you're getting your ass kicked. Right. Now, I will admit that in any situation, if I was laying on a couch and I got snatched up by uh, by Ice Cube and Busta Rhymes, I would probably say whatever they requested as well. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, that was, yo, that was scary. I, I was almost scared. If I wasn't so excited to see him get the beat down. Yeah, for sure. I was for him because it's he, like, dude, I'm sorry. Ice he definitely Cube, deserved it. Yeah, he absolutely deserved it. But I'm sorry. Even Ice Cube, the guy who made Are We There Yet? Are We Done Yet? Mr. Family Friendly Films, Ice Cube. Ice Cube is a scary ass dude. Yeah. Case in point, watch um, the movie. I can't remember the name of the movie at this point, but it's like a, a remake of Three O'Clock High with him and Charlie Day. Yeah. Ice Cube is oh, right, scary right, right, as right. well. What is that called? I, I know what you're talking about then. Or even, you know, Ice Cube, number one, Ice Cube is still the same dude in NWA. He is yeah. still the same guy. Right, for sure. Uh, I and would when, also say that to, um, oh man, to Monet's uh, credit, there are, yeah. a, she doesn't really know uh, Kristen. They haven't really known each other very long at this point. And it's there are a there. lot of, there are a lot of reasons why a freshman college student might be crying alone in her room. Yeah. That are That's not true. rape, right? Like there are a lot of reasons, even, even, even if it is obvious that it's about a boy, there's still a lot of, you don't know much about there this girl, you know? Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right about that. I, and I, I think that it's, I, our, I, I, I think, I'll walk that back. I'll walk that back. Yeah. And I think that I, it's I, pretty, I've never been a female in a college situation, so. And I think that it's pretty common that we we just kind of always assume like, oh, they broke up or he said something nasty to her or like, I think that we're programmed to not assume the worst thing. Right. Right. And, you know, this is nice. This is also 1995. So we're not going to I guess back in those days, you know, did you really assume the worst out of those things? Did we even even make a it's the, oh. um, I mean, this is the, the, the rape culture thing is something that this film does pretty well. And, and even the use of, or the mention of the blue lights, uh, on, on the campus at night. A lot of, a lot of college campuses. Now you see them all on all college yeah. campuses. Cause I know they're at university of Pittsburgh. I know that. Yeah. And well, they were, that. they were, they were on my college. They're on my community college campus. Uh, and exactly. we're not even, a, <laughs> We're not even a residential college, right? Like we don't even have dorms. Right. Um, so I really think though now Kristen, after that sexual assault, now she starts becoming friendly with the character Karen, played by the amazing Jennifer Connolly. Everything man, everything also, Jennifer Connolly does, man. She brings she brings a certain gravitas to it, even when she's not the lead. She is or a secondary. She just has she's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> like she's just so charismatic, right? Like she just has, she just has something that, that is just her voice. Even just her. I think voice. that's what it is. Maybe. I, I don't know what it exa- what it is ex- exactly. It's, it's an intangible quality that is just magnetic, but she, she has really it. draws you in. She draws you in. I'm actually really, really mad that we did not get more. We like, we only got her voice in, Spider-Man Homecoming. There's no more Karen slash suit lady mm. in any of the other Spider-Man films, right. but we are getting her in Top Gun Mavericks. So awesome. Cool. I'm, I'm uh, here for that. Sure to be another super sweaty outing from Tom Cruise and company. Yeah. I, yeah. Cause we already saw, you know, there is a beach ball, there is a beach volleyball scene, but now there's women around. So it's, it's more, it, it's, it's, if there's a little something it's for everybody. equal opportunity gratuity <laughs> yeah pretty much but so the Taryn character sort of becomes her safety zone yeah where she also starts to really explore her sexuality in that way and then we discover that you know she starts taking more of, of a bisexual turn because right. she starts seeing um Wayne who is who was Malik's roommate who dude you want to talk about a bum ass dude man how does he get girls being such a slob oh, because he Did always goes to their place right yeah it looks like it because you even see the point where malik like he showed he just walks into the room late at night blasts his music and lays down and malik just like gets up turns it off and is like dude look at your look at your side of the room dude there's like chinese takeout boxes 
all over the place. He's like, what's wrong with it? <laughs> Bro, that was the th- I was like, yeah, what's wrong with it? <laughs> Bro. Also, he's like, I'll try to clean it up. Look, bro, like, just throw that shit away. You are Cockroach City, my dude. Yeah. You are Joe's apartment. Like, <laughs> what are you doing, my dude? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, so- and Kristen eventually, yeah, you're right. She explores sort of a, a bisexual sexuality. She starts relationships independently with Taryn and with Wayne. Uh, and... and- uh, sort of a peace, a, 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 a seeker of peace. She yeah. takes her trauma and she tries to become peaceful because she starts doing the, the. I, I don't want to be rude when I say this, but it's almost implied that she's becoming sort of a toxic feminist. Right, like a, like, a, like a more militant sort of. Yeah, and he's like, well, aren't you being sexist? I'm interested in women's rights as well as a man, but you're telling me I can't be because I'm a guy. Right. And is he just doing that because he wants to hook up with her? Maybe, but he does have a point. You know, you can be all for women's rights and not be a woman. And that was his point. And that's sort of what gives her the food for thought. And so she starts to become a more encompassing, peaceful person. And she's the reason why we have the setting for the climax because she establishes and sets up. And to her credit, she grows up a lot mm-hmm. and sets up this rally for peace. Yeah. Yeah. And, she good, does. Kudos to her. and kudos to her because she did this. Like she's the one that really got a lot out of the college experience. Was that her band? No, that wasn't her band. <laughs> Whose band was, was that? Who was the lead singer of that band? Of Eve's Plum, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Colleen Fitzpatrick. Thank you Colleen very Fitzpatrick. much. Thank you very much, Wikipedia. Yeah, I wow, thought that that was. That's, that's who that that's, was. That's vitamin C, my <laughs> dude. Oh my God, vitamin C. That's who that was. Yeah, I wow. knew that that person seemed very familiar. Why am I so like hyped up by that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why that got me all hyped up, but it's uh, funny as balls. It is. Um, yeah, so that brings us all the way through Kristen's story. It's time now to discuss Malik. Um, Malik is so clueless. Yeah. Very clueless, very arrogant. He is the exact person that college is meant for. Yeah. In a lot of ways, he's the guy, he's the one that you sent him to college to actually realize, A, the world don't revolve around you. B, you don't know everything. C, the only real wisdom is knowing you don't know a goddamn thing. Yeah. And also D or four, whichever number system you were using, uh, change actually requires effort yes and i love the fact i love how because i was when i had my first black male teacher mr wilds i'll never forget mr wilds i did not appreciate that man as much as i do now as an adult and i really wish that i could get back in touch with him because mr wilds really had sort of the same style as dr phipps did yeah. where he did not take bullshit. If you tried to go up to him that, hey, brother, blah, 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 he shot you down immediately. And he actually said, don't try to con me. And I saw him as an Uncle Tom. I saw Mr. Wilds as a guy that was getting in the way of my progress. And it wasn't. He was challenging me to be better than I was. I had another teacher that was like that too, Mr. Sturdivant. He was my chemistry teacher. Mr. Wilds was my history teacher. And I probably could have learned so much more from those two men if I would have just quit being a stupid asshole. Yeah. Malik had to have his girlfriend, Deja, played by Tyra Banks, sort of point out to him, 
yeah, you're stupid. You, you're you're being an idiot. Right. She really had to point that out to him. And she really broke down every single bit. Like, it's almost like Professor Phipps told him, yeah, you're, you're, you're nowhere near as smart as you think you are. And he even said, it ain't up to me to motivate you. You being here should be enough. And you as a college professor, I'm sure you've had to do that. Look, man, it ain't to... The days of your hand being held by an educator are over. It's up yeah, to that's... you to write your own papers and be able to have a... It's not up to me to sort of teach you where to put a comma, put right. a period, how not to do a fragment, how to back well, up your points. Yeah, that's not and that... Up his point is 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 i think better taken because he's a political science teacher right like he's not an english teacher that's not his job right uh, you you gotta you gotta sort that stuff out on your own oh, i think an english teacher would have given him like an f minus did you see all the red mm -hmm. yeah. ink it, it, i'm sorry man if i'm an english teacher i'm giving home i'm giving malik an f minus 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 and then i'm going to his coach and like yo you need to revoke his scholarship in full my dude because this kid is dumber than a box of rocks in a sandstorm i think it's really just that he just doesn't care right like in and, and it's it, he doesn't he doesn't see the value of of education, education i guess and i guess he's never had to put a value on education because even fudge calls him out on his ignorance when he goes do you have the autobiography autobiography of frederick Douglass? what right. turned you on the double oh i need it for a class why else would i read it and he even says to get smarter right i thought you were one of the good ones right like that's right or one of the smart ones and it, yeah right. and i i agree i mean honestly man like if there's one thing that every person should read it's that book that is a remarkable book Autobiography of Frederick Douglass, I think anything by James Baldwin is also very important yeah. for you to read. Mm -hmm. I actually had a I actually had someone at my company that I work for try to come to me and go, Well, I, I, I try really, really hard and I really want to understand so that I can be a better person. And I feel like that, you know, the black culture as well as, you know, my culture, you know, we we can just understand each other better. So I said, well, then I suggest you read um, James Baldwin. Yeah. I think mean, that if you start, if you start with James Baldwin, I think that will help. About a year later, I said, hey, so did you read anything by um, Baldwin that I suggested? Oh, no, I haven't had, got around to that yet. Okay. You're just blowing smoke. All right. Yeah. Then yeah. never mind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I... Then why waste time having this discussion? But I think that James Baldwin, Frederick Douglass, I would even say um, some of the other works by um, some works by Marcus Garvey, um, Malcolm X's speeches. I would, I would put his autobiography. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would even say, listen to Martin Luther King's speeches that aren't just I have a dream and don't just take the stanza of I have a dream. Yeah, read letters from, from a Birmingham from jail. His, right, especially his letters from the Birmingham jail. And um, let me double check. I'm trying to think. There's one um, book that most recently came out. And the only reason why I have to look is because the author's name kind of escapes me. Ely Mistel, and I'm probably Ely Mistel, who's um, I'm probably butchering his name, and I apologize for that wrote this book, Allow Me to Report, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. I've heard him speak a few times, and he's very, very, I mean, he's fiery, and he's very, very passionate, but he's also very, very informed. He's been on The View. He's been on MSNBC to discuss certain things, and he doesn't pull any punches, you know? So, but the whole point is, is that you're right. The autobiography of Frederick Douglass, I think that anybody that calls themselves wanting to be enlightened needs to it's a read. good place to start i agree and i and you can see the disappointment in ice cube's face yeah when he goes why else why else would i read it like that well, that's disappointment. Like, well fudge i think is is probably staying at the college for so long because he actually really values what he's learning there right like he feels he's he's sort of the 
other extreme of Malik, right? That he completely understands the value of the education where it almost becomes the point where he's like a teaching assistant for uh, Professor right. Morpheus, right? Yeah, well, I like that, Professor Morpheus. <laughs> but that's why I also say that he's a more, he's a clueless version yeah. of Fudge. Because at least, it's almost like Fudge is an asshole, but he at least is educated. Right. He's just an asshole. Well, when all three of them are sitting together talking near the end and uh, Professor Morpheus is like, when are you going to learn? And then Fudge is like, oh, he'll figure it out one day. Like, like, like he's right. Like right on that same level. Like they're two old dudes, like sitting there talking about a kid. Right. <laughs> right. And Malik is just sitting like, Thur. right. Bum, 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 bum. Malik is annoyingly naive. He, he's the worst type of being naive because he believes that he knows everything, right? Well, I think Malik that a big part of Malik, Malik is uh, that kid that has that used athletics as his ticket out, right? And right. and he thinks like a lot, like I think a lot of people that do that, uh, he thinks that the athletics will always be there for him. Uh, yeah. and that, you know, he's faster than everybody, et cetera, et cetera. But here he's not even faster than everybody. Right. He's no, only he's on a really partial not. scholarship, which is sort of his first. Oh, he had a, he had a full scholarship and then the coach pulled his scholarship and made it a partial because. to sort of wake him up right. because he's lazy. Cause he, you know what? Malik is the quintessential of. He had all the success in high school. He never had to work. Yeah. He just did. And then now it's, dude, you, it's time to grow up. You've got to work harder. And even, and you, and you love, I think what really sort of kicked into his mind was when he said, when it was when um, Professor Morpheus says, so what happens if the other team has a runner that's stronger, faster, more of a big time athlete than you? Are you just going to run away? He goes, no, I'm going to run faster. Exactly. And then that, that bing, light turns on moment. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the moment where Malik starts to become a, he goes from being a caricature to a character right um and i would also point out the i mean obviously all of professor morpheus's lectures are really important uh he just stays doling out red pills but the <laughs> like there's one monologue where he talks about uh how no one is going to treat you special just because you're a b c d e f g right like down the line and yeah. it's a really telling speech uh i mean even for Kristen, right who is he says what are you and she goes i i don't know <laughs> right like that that's right. sort of her like our moment with her where she's like she admits that she doesn't really know what she is uh she doesn't but, know who she is she doesn't know what she is and she's, she's seeking that identity and that's what they all three have in common right is that they're all three seeking an identity either intentionally or not, that is what they're doing. And that's what being 18, 19, 20, that's what being in college is about, is seeking out who you are going to be. Right. Honestly, I think that if Remy had Professor Morpheus as his teacher, if he had one of those classes, he would have been much better off. Yeah, I think. he would have been. Well, and Remy does the thing that, that you worry about so much is he gets indoctrinated and then he drops out and isolates himself even further from the thing that could save him. Right. And even to the point where in Cole Hauser, you want to talk about a sort of a, 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 a sneaky MVP. He is like for like, we've seen, I've seen a lot of movies where there are characters in them and it's like, man, imagine if they use what they had for good instead of evil. We even heard it in X, not about in the, the film X with um 
with um, Denzel Washington, where he makes the comment that West Indian Archie could have been a mathematician, a math whiz. Instead, he was a hustler. The character Scott, he could have done so much good if he didn't have so much hate in his heart. Because this is another guy. He's like the he's the polar opposite of Fudge. Very insightful, very intelligent, very charismatic, but he's evil because yeah. he's got all this hate in his heart. And it's like he could have really done a lot for individuals if he were a positive influence. But instead, he's just a monster, a, a I don't even want to call him a sociopath, but he's just so he's his hate has him so disconnected to the human that if you're not quote unquote pure Aryan blood, he has no use for you. Yeah. And man, Cole Hauser, for some roles that he's taken that you kind of look at him, you're just kind of like, yeah, that's probably not the best film. But there's so many movies he's done where he is such a great character. Look at him in School Ties, which is probably one of the one of the better movies of the early 90s. His his role in Days Can Confuse. This film, Goodwill Hunting, even in Too Fast, Too Furious, Pitch Black. He is a good actor and he has he's another one that has that it factor when it comes to his voice, his tone, his presence. Well, and he, you, in this role, you needed someone with that. You needed that charisma because essentially he's a small time cult leader, right? He really is. And you he, needed he, you needed it to be convincing that he was able to take this young, impressionable guy and brainwash him, essentially. Right. Yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, brainwash slash sort of opened up the basically made it oh made it okay for him to let out his hate yeah um the because as you said did it really take a lot to indoctrinate him into hate? yeah no i mean this guy saw himself in these people right that's why he latched on so quickly right and also and... let's let's have a moment i want to have one moment here where the first time he hung out with these people it was in a room full of swastikas like, yeah, <laughs> it's not like they snuck yeah. it up on him, right? Like they were just like, hey, welcome to the Nazi den. We're your Nazi friends. Are you cool with it? And he must have just been like, yeah, sounds good, dude. Yeah. Meanwhile, I went to a friend's house and because she's Southern, she has a Confederate flag. And I'm just like, yeah, right. And I so like this dude. This dude's 18. There's no way he doesn't know what a swastika is, but he still decided to stick around. So he wasn't that far from a Nazi to begin with. Right. It's one of those. So you may not, you may not identify yourself as a racist, but racism isn't a turnoff for you. Is it? This is one of those guys that like, so at some point during high school, he raised his hand and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like Hitler, he had some pretty good ideas, right? Uh, I'm not a racist, but some of my best friends are. Right. I'm not saying that I hate the Jewish people, but, but I think that if you listen to what Hitler had to say, you would think that he had some sound policies. Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can kind of. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I also want to point out before we get to the climax, which is, I think, the next step. Uh, I think the well, strongest. I want, the I want to talk about that fight for a minute. <laughs> oh, we can do the that too. Versus black guys. Yeah, uh, we can talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to just point out while yeah, we were yeah. talking about Malik, that the strongest evidence for how strong he is physically as an athlete is during the opening credit sequence when Homie straight up nails a nail into a cinder block. Did you see that? Yeah, <laughs> I, man, I'm, I'm out. I'm out I'm on my front stoop replacing steps right and i'm trying to put nails in the wood and i'm like damn it I, he's I hanging get, hats I'm up afraid. around his he, dorm room <laughs> like it's nothing i'm like my right. dude either those are the softest ass cinder blocks or you are mighty you are yeah. a mighty you must be in the boss tones because you are mighty mighty 
Yeah, and before somebody's like, well, those holes were probably pre-drilled. Of course they were pre-drilled, but why did John Singleton have this dude hold a hammer and pretend like he nailed that thing in? <laughs> <laughs> My God. like That was the only time where I was like, come on, John. <laughs> you could do better, my dude. Do yeah. Better. I mean, there was um, even a wooden wall in that dorm. Like, you right? didn't even have to Why use the cinder block. Hats? Why are you nailing hats <laughs> to the wall? Why? Better yet, my dude, you can't use the pegs that are for that on the right by your door. Right. Just grab a hat and go. You can't hang those on a bedpost, my dude. Yeah. So, anyway, oh, let's talk oh. about your fight. Yeah, for one, the Busta Rhymes character dreads is absolutely hilarious. Like my buddy, um, my buddy Truck and I used to laugh about this character all the time. Yeah. Like when they went to go get Billy and his frat buddy, when they call security, and he's like, These gang members just grabbed our fraternity brother. The fuck, white boy, you know we go to school here too. Shut the fuck up before I rip you off them stairs. <laughs> Dude, Busta Rhymes has zero chill in this movie. Yeah, he goes from zero to uh, like nobody's business. And this fight is no different because you got yeah. Ice Cube. He's just like smiling. Yeah, I'm gonna fight you. Malik is like, oh, I want to fight. I want to fight. No name, Big Brother's just cracking knuckles because that's what right. he does. And here's Busta Rhymes, oh! <laughs> like like he's freaking. Michael Buffer announcing, let's get ready to rumble. It's like he walked he straight like, off the set of Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Can See. Right. And he's the only one taking on two people at once. Right. You see these two guys are running away scared. It's like, <laughs> my dude, do you need some Prozac? For someone who smokes some, as much weed as his character does, he is not mellow at all. Right. But that fight... Now, here's the thing. For those that are just watching this for what it is, they're just seeing black guys beat up neo-Nazis. But I really appreciate, once again, this is how Fudge and Scott are almost, they're the same character. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, the, the black guys are celebrating, we beat their asses. And he's like, man. You really think one fight is going to undo 400 plus years of oppression, bondage, and slavery? Do you really think that matters? Especially it when you're matters. fighting these these assholes that don't even have any actual power, right? Right. And even Scott is like, shut up. <laughs> you're sitting there, like, he, he really just looks at him and goes, shut up. Like you really like, and he's even like, you really think one fight matters, but then he kind of goads Remy into going, taking that next step. Yeah. He's doing the cult leader thing. Right. But even still, he's like, oh, wow, we got beat up. Big deal. Like he doesn't even care. You know, um, I have another thing to say before we get to the climax. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was talking earlier about how this movie had sort of like predicted certain things. Yeah. And there's a conversation early between Malik and Ice Cube or Malik and Fudge uh, mm -hmm. about if Malik were at a football game and they played the national anthem, what would he mm -hmm. do? And he says, well, I guess I'll st I would stand because it would be embarrassing not to. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the naivete. Right. But I just thought, wow, like, Wow, like how ahead of its time was it to predict that? And it's it's not only that, but it's the first shot of the film is the American flag. And the final shot of the film is the American flag with the Star Spangled Banner playing over it. Yeah, uh, this movie is very deep. And I'll tell you the truth. I think that when you look at the power of John Sing Singleton's films, this is right, I, this and Boys in the Hood are right there because they're predicting so, like, well, this film predicted so much. And as we get to the climax, I'm going to make my points. This is something that I was telling Sharon about that I really want to hit home. And I want to get your idea on this. This, like, Boys in the Hood showed white America and people that don't live in the hood. This is what people are going through. Right. And this film sort of shows, A, the naivete of college students, 
But then also, not everything is what it appears. And no matter what, there's always something below the surface. And with the with the national anthem, the, the talking about, because keep in mind, in the mid-90s, we weren't talking a lot of stuff like this about Columbus back then, about how right. he was a racist, about how much of a fraud he was. We weren't talking about that. Well, and here, they, they make much about his statue and the fact that they've named this university after him, which is obviously something that's come up in recent years. Uh, not just with Columbus, but with other names as well, and statues. Yeah, this film, really ahead of its time. It, we talk a lot of times in pop culture, talk about the Simpsons predicting so many things. But this film predicted much. Um, and going into the climax, when you look at what happened, for one, Tyra Banks acted her ass off in this film. Yeah. She was so amazing in this. But you also look at now the Remy character and what happened. And when Malik goes after him. And the response by the campus security. Right, which we haven't really talked about much, but who are oh all God. pretty shitty the whole time. The campus security are just trash. They're a complete waste of time. But also, Remy is Dylan Roof before Dylan Roof. Remy is a number of white men shooters who are apprehended without being gunned down. Yeah, he absolutely is. Because what did they do? It's twice now. That, that, was, that was twice in that movie where they went after Malik and Remy was allowed to walk. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's Dylan Roof. He's, he's the dark Knight rises shooter. He's the Boston marathon bomber. He's, uh, you know, I mean, they're by all accounts, the Columbine shooters would have gotten out too, if they hadn't killed themselves. Like he's, he's all of them. Right. And at the same time, Malik, is is beat to within an inch of his life by the same police and he's not even the shooter right and then when remy takes his own life you know the cop is like all throughout the movie he is so disrespectful he is so so just condescending but when it comes to remy hey come on pal come on come on don't right. do this kid Come on, like they come were on, on the ass, ass so fast, beating the shit out of him, and then or like showing this, the Nazi flag, showing that swastika to a bunch of black people. Yeah, and he thinks nothing of it. Oh, you won't sh you you shut down our party, but you don't hear that music down the hall. I dig rock and roll. Yeah, I mean, and then That's, you know, this this piece of actual human garbage is trying to do us all a favor by offing himself and they're trying to talk him out of it. Right. Um, it's like, come on, man, just, just let it happen. Uh, well, and it does. So, it does. but it, what makes me mad is that he tried to stop it. And sometimes you just can't stop these things. You just gotta. Yeah. I mean, I would say that the, the one I don't, it is, it is wild that how many times you see armed white men disarmed, and, and taken into custody when they have clear designs on like suicide by police most of the time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But then how many times you see unarmed or defenseless black men gunned, gunned down by police with no attempt to disarm because there's not even anything to disarm them, right? No. I would say to de-escalate. No, no attempt to de-escalate. There is no, and, and you're right, there is no de-escalation. What is it? All it is, is you see, a, you just see something, you're just scared of it and you kill it. It's like the, the, the white supremacy is you see black children as threats and black men as boys. Yeah. But you're killing them either way. It's like, you don't even see us as people. It's just, you know what? You're not, you don't look like me. You're not me. 
So I just kill you. Yeah, it's it is uh, a you know at this point the movie is twenty six, twenty seven years, years old, old. and it's and it's every bit as relevant now as it was when it was made, which is what we've said about a bunch of these movies. You know, we said it about Do the Right Thing, we said it about Boys in the Hood, uh, and it is you know. It's sad uh, yeah. that these things continue to be a commentary on our contemporary life as opposed to a historical artifact. Right. You know, yeah, because nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, an argument can be made, and I'm going to say it now, things are worse. Why? Because the idea of white supremacy is no longer acceptable. And those that are in power are terrified of losing their power. I I would say only that it is. I would I would agree that it's worse, but I would say that it's the kind of worse that, if channeled correctly, could could lead to more progress. And that's just because of um, the more like the use the the citizenry turning the surveillance on the perpetrators, right? Or on, on the police state. And the more that we force the society to look at the terrible things that they do, the more likely it is to move the needle. Uh, and I understand the point to that. I truly do. But when you look at a lot of the laws and legislation that is passing, what is it doing? It's being set to keep things the way they are. And yeah, I'm not saying I'm not disagreeing that no, that I know you're not that the white supremacists not. aren't having their like last gasp of you know what I mean like and that if you don't if we, if if we aren't careful and we don't vote for the right people etc cetera, etc cetera, that they won't have some success for sure that that is happening and not and not just in the federal elections but in right. local elections. It's, it's the national. local elections. The local elections, I believe, are just as important, if not more important. They're definitely more important to how they touch our daily lives. Yeah, because here's the thing. When I say local elections, I don't just mean in your city, but I also mean in your state, your state legislation, your governors, all the way down to school board. It's important. Yeah. But I guess my only thing is that I want to have faith in humanity. I want to have faith that things get worse before they get better. And this is the last gasp. But in other token, I'm just like, I don't know. I hope so. Well, there's but I don't that. know. You know, we're, know we're, 30, we're, we're 30, we're 30 years past of this film and Colin Cap the, the Colin Kaepernick situation is brought up, even though it's a only a hypothetical. Um, the police brutality of unarmed black men, the Dylan Roof slash any other white active shooter, well, the majority, mm -hmm. and even just certain aspects, the microaggressions of society as a whole, and you know some because. Do you think some some of the white people that are in this film that look like they're truly terrified of these white supremacists, they're still displaying racist behavior in their own ways? Yeah. Not to mention the uh, the attacks on women as well. Yeah, I would say that um, it's similar, and uh, in, in its final act is similar to the final act of "Do the Right Thing." Uh, yeah in that it often requires a, a, a traumatic moment for actual progress to be made, if that makes sense. No, you're, you're like you're a absolutely collective right. trauma that we all, that we all experience. And in this case, in both cases, it's either like a small neighborhood or a college campus. Uh, but right. I think that it is indicative of, like larger social change because, you know, like George Floyd was one of those moments, right? Where we had a collective trauma 
And of course, there were some people that excluded themselves from that using a variety of mental gymnastics. But by and large, that was a collective national trauma for for many, many, many of us. Global. Yeah, global. global. And, um, it did, I, and it did move the needle a little bit, right? Because there you have the successful prosecution of a police officer. All of all four of them. Yeah, you're right. Um, I also think that all three characters get their own form of growth and enlightenment because you see Remy, he recognizes, he, he's, he's recognizing what he did was wrong and he is overcome by guilt. Do you think that's true? Well, he, he, when he was saying, I'm sorry, he was talking to Malik. The, the, the police are thinking that he's just saying, oh, I'm because sorry. Because he oh, was going to shoot Malik when they were in the hall, when they were in the stairwell. Well, I think it just took that ass beating for him to finally knock, the, knock some screws right. See, I think that the, that the apologies were just all about not being able to get away because he was locked in. I think that... If he were, like, his moment of guilt should have been on the roof, but he just kept firing. Yeah, well, I think that when he, I think what it was for him is he locks eyes with Malik, okay? He sees Malik covered in blood. Now it's become real. Because at that moment, he's up on the roof. There is no personal connection. It's almost like he was just firing. You know what I mean? It looked yeah. to me like he was yeah. shooting. And now here's Malik in his face in that rage and he's covered in blood. And to me, that's like, oh, I messed. I did. It's like, holy crap. And now Malik is coming and he's terrified because he's facing consequences. And now his he's sorry because it's like, wow, I did that. I did this. Yeah, I don't. I don't buy it. I don't think he's. Don't I, I. I just don't because every at every turn he goes for his gun. Like if he's well, actually I, sorry for killing a person, then why would he try to kill another one? Because he. Because he. He. That's part of his character, and he even said it. He's been shooting guns, been around guns since he was nine years old. That's literally all he knows to do. Well, then, the, but then, then that's not remorse, right? Out. The, then that's not remorse. Like if there's, if you're actually remorseful for an action, then you stop doing that action. Well, I mean, I don't see that. I, I see it as at that point, he doesn't know. He, he's, he's, he's just this scared idiot. Yeah. He, he's yes. Brought, he's brought back to just being an idiot. And then what does he do? He turns the gun on himself. That's the only thing he knows to do. Right, to because right. he's a weak. Uh, he's weak. He's a coward, and now he's got to face the. He's got to face you know the consequences of his actions. But I just I don't know. Like I don't hear him in the stairwell trying to apologize. That was his opportunity one on one with Malik to try to talk to him, right, and try to apologize. And I know Malik wouldn't have heard it, right, because Malik was like ready to go. But at the same time, like there was like I didn't hear any remorse until he was trapped. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Yeah, he's trapped. He knows. He knows. I think that at that moment he gets trapped and it's like. He gets it. He knows. I don't know. I, I just I, 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 just, I don't I don't I, think that I mean, that sort of builds in sort of a like like a moral undertone to his suicide that like his suicide is like self repentance in some way but it's not it's just his way out i don't know. I, I, I mean i i i agree with you that is his way out that's the only way out he knows all he knows is guns that's the only thing that he knows that gives him so you don't so you don't think that his suicide is brought on by the fact that he's in, in, incredible that he feels tremendous guilt I think it's one part guilt, one part he just doesn't want to face it. He just, he doesn't want to face what he's done. Yeah, see, I think it's only that. Okay. But, but that's just because I think he's a piece of shit, like through and through. Like, I don't think that he, I don't think that there's, so I, so I'll say this. I don't think that there's enough evidence to suggest that he has a real turn of heart. 
No, I don't think he. I I think he's. I think he goes from being the the super duper wannabe white supremacist to being that clueless idiot again, who's still a piece of shit, even if now, he's a clueless. Yeah. Idiot. Now it could be that that recognizing what he's done snaps him out of like the fever that he's been in, you know, for the last little bit. Yeah. And now I think just, that's more of what I'm saying. He got right. snapped out of that. I can get on board with that. Uh, that, that checks out. That doesn't, that to me doesn't necessarily equal remorse. That just means no. like, he's like, Oh shit. Right. Like I did something. Right. And I think when he's apologizing, he's just trying to talk his way out of it. And the more it becomes clear to him that he can't talk his way out of it, he's just, he's got to take the, take the other way out, you know, take that road. Yeah. And then of course, Malik starts to take on more of importance on education. And you start to see that when he, when um, Professor Morpheus is reading his paper Mm -hmm. and um, he's no more even just, you know, he's able to say, you know, my girl died here, you know, blah, blah, blah. When Kristen is starting to wallow, yeah, he's like, you know, he sort of comforts her. Yeah. You know, and it's like, so. I think that you get the growth of characters based on who they are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Remy, he got his growth based on the fact, well, growth in air quotes, Mm -hmm. that he sort of, he took this step, regressed back to who he was before, to someone that maybe if he had a more positive influence, he could actually not be a piece of shit. Yeah, I think that maybe the my problem is with the word growth because it implies positive, like it, it implies a particular like sort of positive trajectory. I think just development is maybe a better word. All right, well, all right. So let, let's ev- use the maybe term. even evolution or de or de evolution or let's go let's go with development. Um, he he evolved he evolved and then he de evolved. Yeah, I mean they're they're all three static or they're all three dynamic characters. They go they all go through change. But that right. change is, I don't think that Remy has a moment of grace. Uh, no, he's one of the, he's one of the few characters in this film that has zero saving grace. He has no, there, there's, there's no sort of, I guess, lack of a better term, redeeming quality. Yeah. In him. Cause even Scott has somewhat, somewhat of a redeeming quality. And as far as, but just as quickly as it comes, it goes right back to now. Nah, this guy's still a Nazi piece of shit. Right. <laughs> but um, of, yeah. of, I, I, guess I should say of uh, some of our main characters, he's the only one that has zero kind of redeeming quality. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a solid conversation. I feel like that's just about, well, just about all of it. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm willing to go that route. Um, not seeing anything about budget on this. Uh, do you see anything? I see uh, that it made thirty eight point three million at the box office. Yeah, that's really all I'm seeing. Let me see. I, I think learning. somewhere I saw like twenty million or something. Uh, um, it got 20, 20 million in um rentals. In rentals. Um, mm. The film budget was estimated six and a half million dollar budget. That's according okay. to the LA.com. Okay, that that'll do. And so it made its money back. And John Singleton. Uh, well, I'll I'll save those thoughts for our uh, ratings. Uh, also, over on the Rotten Tomatoes, we were talking about this earlier. Um, the uh, higher learning is sporting a uh, disappointing 45% based on 40 reviews. Uh, but we've talked about this before. A lot of times movies that came out before the internet was widely available don't have a lot of reviews to balance out. So they can be either really, really high or really low. It's not really a fair testament. I think that the audience score here is probably more fair. Yeah. And also a lot of the people that were sort of slamming it are people that maybe the film just isn't made for. Yeah, they're, they're they're missing the larger point, I think. Yeah, and I mean, you know what? And that's fine. You know, there, there's a lot of films that are like that, where they're gonna like reviewers are gonna reviewers and critics are gonna miss the larger point. It is what it is. 
It is what it is. Uh, well, let's get Bartender Smiley in here, and we can start wrapping this thing up. The Plotaholics rating system for the movies is a pretty simple system. Basically, they rate movies based on how many shots it takes to get through them. So if you got a good movie and you get through it all the way sober, then it takes zero shots to get through the movie. And then if you got a really bad movie, then it could take up to five shots to get through the whole thing. I think you can try to figure out the middle part yourself. So what can I get you? All right. Uh, well, would you like uh, first go, Mr. Tan? Yeah, sure. Um, Higher Learning is a film that really is just ahead of its time. And I think that that is both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's a curse because, you know, at the time it was more of a niche market. And, but now, but it also sort of, it's really, really prophetic in a lot of ways. And it should be far more relevant today in our society than it is. Um, once again, very strong characters, strong acting. John Singleton knew exactly what he was doing. Did an amazing job. Very, very thought provoking. And um, I mean, it's not without some of its problems, obviously. But overall, this is a solid, solid film. This isn't a film that you really want to visit often, though, because it is. I don't want, I'm not going to go so far and say that it's traumatizing, but it will it will sort of put you in a rough headspace. But at the same token, sometimes when you need something thought provoking, that's what it's supposed to do. It does what it does. I give it a one shot rating. Yeah, I, I will echo your one shot. For me, there were moments sort of in the back half of it that felt like it got a little bogged down. It, it, it does a lot. Uh, in a little bit of time, right? I mean, two and a, two hours, seven minutes. Uh, it does mostly fly by, but there are a lot of stories uh, happening. You know, it's trying to deal with a lot of yeah. issues with with college campus culture, and um, you know, for better or worse, I think sometimes it kind of like gets lost in that. Sometimes, but but rarely. Um, it is by and large way ahead of its time. And, and here's the thing that I want to say about John Singleton that, that continues to sort of stand out to me is that he's one of these guys that had such a clear artistic vision that every time he put a story to film, it was striking. Uh, it was um, important. It, it asked you to look at uh, societal injustices and it dared you to look away from it uh, while mm -hmm. commanding that you couldn't, right? And th his films are, at least the three that we've looked at so far, especially Boys in the Hood and Higher Learning, are incredibly powerful films. And, uh, you know, it just some little minor things here, you know, like Omar Epps can't hammer a nail through a cinder block. Uh, no. but that, but even that is not right. worth the one shot, right? Like it's, it is very close to perfect. I feel like there are just a few times that it kind of, I don't want to say it loses itself. It just kind of gets bogged down a little bit. Um, yeah, I agree. I can definitely agree with that. I think yeah. that, I think that one of the more, there, there are, there are also some characters that I think are kind of underused. Um, the David Isaacs, the character David Isaacs played by um, Adam Goldberg. Mm. I think that maybe, I think I, I would like to think that maybe if we had a little bit more of his character, but his he served his purpose in a lot of ways, but it's like, we just never see him again. Yeah. yeah. You know, there, I think there's a lot of aspects of this film as well that I really think that, when you have an ensemble cast like that, you get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. And um, I think that he, and I think that that character is one that sort of suffers that. Yeah. Um, cool, man. Uh, yeah. So that is uh, this year's John Singleton film. And uh, next week, Mr. Tan, uh, we will be throwing an, audible. Throwing, an audible. throwing an audible. Yeah. We had discussed hot to trot. Uh, starring everyone. God damn it! Ah! Uh, 
starring, <laughs> starring everyone's favorite Bobcat Goldthwait as a horse. Uh, right? Well, he's not a horse. He talks to a horse. Oh, he talks to he a talks. horse. Yeah, John Candy is the horse. Oh, okay. Well, excuse me. This summer, John Candy is a horse. <laughs> um, but no, we're, we're throwing an audible. But um, we should there's... still do that one soon because I do want to. But instead, we're going to do the new yeah, ish, uh, the well, the brand new uh, Netflix original, The Bubble, um, starring literally every person you've ever heard of. Uh, have you looked at the cast list for this, Brian? I did, and I'm just like, huh. So everyone that Judd Apatow has ever spoken to, yeah, basically, uh, and I, 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 like Judd Judd Apatow, he he's one of those guys where it's like, you know what? I have to block him on Twitter, otherwise I'll never watch another movie that he does. I mean, he's and, an idiot, but. He's, he's a moron, but he makes good movies. He makes funny right. Films. That's and that's kind of the thing, right? Is like, I don't, I don't think that Judd App. Well, we are unaware of anything morally uh, reprehensible that Judd Apatow himself has done. But Judd Apatow also voices some truly remarkably stupid opinions. Uh, yeah. And Judd Apatow is just an idiot. He, he's a, he's yeah. a, he's an idiot as a human being. But as Which a is so interesting because when you watch his films, you're like, these are the films that are, these are the result of like a thoughtful, insightful person, you know? Um, yeah, it's weird. So it's almost like Judd, Judd Apatow is book smart, but he's socially inept. Yeah. So we yeah. will uh, be discussing The Bubble, which is a film uh, about um, the about like uh, the film industry during COVID-19 and, and all the protocols that they had to go through. And uh, I watched it this weekend. It's pretty good. I'm not going to say much about it because I want Brian to watch it. Uh, but yeah, I think you're going to enjoy yourself. And the cast is obviously stellar. Um, so I look forward to revisiting this again next week. And, you know, it's new. So I thought let's and it's uh, available, widely available for people to watch uh on yeah. netflix so yeah so we'll get into it yeah. stars uh keegan michael key david duchovny kate mckinnon um i mean everybody Cena, james yeah. mcavoy the guy who put cheese on your nachos that time um mm-hmm. kate mckinnon your bu- your, your high school bus driver for grades 10 and 11 yeah and roy can't forget about roy yeah roy's in there too and also a squirrel that i almost ran over one time Oh, nice. Yeah. Did I tell you about the squirrel that I ran over once? I don't think I that so you bad. did. I felt so bad. I named him Alvin, and I was so freaking out while I was driving because, like, I was taking Sharon to work on my way to go to work, and the and he ran out in the street, and it's like, well, I'm not going to wreck to avoid hitting a squirrel. That's dumb. Yeah. So I was really upset. I was like, Alvin, no! And I was all freaked out, and Sharon was like, are you okay? I said, no, I killed Alvin, and I was all upset. And some truck drove by and it said Alvin's paper. And I was like, fate is mocking me. He owned a paper company. And sure freaking, was like, okay, you wait. freaking murdered a super industrious squirrel. I really did. I'm a horrible human being. I, 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 poor, the fact that I, poor Dwight the chipmunk is going to have to pick up the slack now over at Alvin's paper company. Yeah, I am Murdigly Erdler. Uh, well, with that being said, uh, I'm Shane Wilson, and that is alleged murderer Brian Tan, and we'll be back next week with more Plotaholics podcast. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, guys. Brian will be here uh, pending his court date. <laughs> Take a trip with us to New Bob. Just promise not to drink. Oh my God. If you get sucked into the matrix, matrix, we will send the phone for you. Do you believe in fate? But every movie has a plot hole, and every hole gets filled somehow with whiskey, wine, or blue milk. Just don't cut me off right now.
hearts apart for you. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man.